This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Kenji. You weren't here last week. I know, so we just guessed. You know, hold it close. to share this morning. Susan is back. Yay. Yay. Yay! And the Aging Gracefully and Joyfully class is meeting tomorrow with Garth, and he will be talking about ways to capture our history and our family's history. So that's at 1 o'clock tomorrow. So please join. Becca has a couple of announcements. Young folks, those in grades 6 through 12, are encouraged to join me and a few others as we go to the planetarium this coming Saturday. We're going to meet at 445. We have the whole place to ourselves. That's going to be awesome. We also have another event on the 24th from 1 to 3. This is the end of the uh, winter break week from school. So at this point in the week, I think that most caregivers are going to be insane and want to get the small people out of the house, which is why I scheduled it for this day. So that afternoon, we have a whole bunch of fun art projects. Jane's cooking up some art projects. I've got some art projects. It's going to be great. We'll have games. Um, a good afternoon to hang out with friends. Perfect. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can talk to Becca. Uh, we are collecting for Mothers in Need of Others dish detergent, and uh, there is a basket there at the back. We'll be doing that all month, and so any type, please, if you're able to, we would appreciate contributions. Tom. Yes. <laughs> We'll see everyone right after church, uh, even though we're having the uh, communion this morning, it's going to be a short service anyway, so we'll have more time. <laughs> we'll see. Sorry. We shall see. So, <laughs> so we'll see everybody after worship for a great uh, count, uh, getting to know you better. Class. Great, thank you. Sorry. And Benita and Anika just came in, so we are excited to be able to. It makes it a, a much better interview. It is good to be with you today. It is good to be part of this community. And uh, actually, before I. Where is she? Hey, so when. I don't know if she can hear. Can you just? No, I hear you. <laughs> this this is one other announcement I want to hold out as a great celebration. This week, Soin passed her thesis defense, and come May will be Dr. Soin. Congratulations, Soin! We are very very excited for you. What was the topic? You can talk about it. Um, <laughs> it's a fantastic thesis, and uh, so we are very, very proud of So Win. So yes, come May, she'll be graduating, and uh, we'll be Dr. Win, and we're very excited for her. Let's turn to our responsive call to worship. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of heaven and earth. 
God sits above the circle of the earth and stretches out the heavens like a curtain. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let us pray together. Loving God, it is good to sing praises to you. It is good to be together as a church family. Those who are here in person, those who watch online, we are thankful for all the people who call LABC home. We pray that you would bless us in our time together as we seek to honor and lift up your voice, your name on high, and to hear what you have to say to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us sing together, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Verses 1 through 9 and 14 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly but because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the, path, the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop 
some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today in Sunday School, we are learning this parable. We're going to really dive deeply and analyze this parable, this lesson that Jesus uh, gives us in Mark chapter 4. And um, I thought one of the best ways to illustrate this, I was going to bring bird seed and just throw it around the room. Um, but I didn't think that perhaps Michael or Ken or really Lloyd would really appreciate that. Um, so I thought maybe this would be the best way to kind of illustrate the parable. So when I bought this at the garden center back in the summertime, it was a big, beautiful gardenia. And it is not anymore. And <clears throat> it is still shedding leaves. And I have done a lot of research, but something is not right, clearly. <laughs> something is not right. So there is... Um, what I know about plants, which is not a lot, is that they need good soil, the right amount of light, the right amount of space, they need the right pot size in the right location, the right amount of, did I do soil, did I do water, space, pot, location? I have tried all of these things. I have experimented, I have changed the pot, change the soil, change the water, change the light, change the temperature, change the location. Something is still not right. But I do know that this plant, if given the correct amount of all of these things, should be a big, beautiful gardenia. If I get it right, this should have big, glossy, fat, gorgeous green leaves. And it should even make these really nice white flowers that smell wonderful. That is not happening. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, this happens to all of us in our faith sometimes, right? Sometimes our faith is like this gardenia. We try all the things, but something is not working, and we are not spiritually well, right? Um, <clears throat> like plants need all these things, we, in order to be spiritually healthy, need several things as well. We need prayer. Help me out here. We need prayer. Reading scripture. Reading scripture, right? We need to dig into the word. We need to read the word, we need to read about the word. Meditating. Meditating. Mindfulness is really important, absolutely. Being in touch with our feelings, being emotionally healthy. Singing, praising God with music and song. Some people need walking or jogging. They need that physical 
uh, element to be spiritually healthy. What else do we need? Community. Community, right? We need to be with friends. We need, sometimes we need to be alone, but we also need to have that togetherness. We need to know that we're cared for. We need a combination of factors in order to be spiritually healthy. And sometimes, despite our best efforts, it just isn't working, right? We're not spiritually healthy. The key is to know when we are not spiritually healthy and to ask for help. So part of the reason I brought this plant in here today is because I wanted to teach you a lesson based on the parable of the sower, but also because I need help. And I knew that when I brought this to church, a few people would look at it and immediately say, <laughs> because when I brought this to church the other day, I didn't say to Ken what this was for. I just brought it into my office. And he said, oh, uh, and I know that he had some opinions about this. And then Maka Din, she has some opinions too about plants. She probably says, oh, it needs sugar water or something. I don't know. <laughs> and Miss Jane, oh yeah. Milk, the, the, the milk from the bottom of the carton, the Edwin Sandy, maybe something like that. I tried that too. <coughs> Miss Jane, also as good as plants. So I'm hoping that one of them um, might be able to create an Easter miracle <laughs> <laughs> with this and um, maybe also teach me about how to keep this healthy. Because I'm not, I, you know, I looked on the internet, but the internet's not good for everything. Right. Sometimes we need wisdom from our elders. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm hoping that the three of you can work together and make my gardenia beautifully, wonderfully as God intended, with big, green, lush, green. Oh, Makatong is here too. She knows all about plants. <laughs> Big, beautiful, green, lush leaves with big white flowers that smell beautiful. That this plant can be everything that God intended it to be. Right? All right, friends. Thank you, Trevor. <laughs> All right, friends, so remember, what do we need to be spiritually healthy? Community, meditation, prayer, reading scripture, mindfulness, togetherness, good friends and faith, we need to praise, we need to be physically healthy, we need a whole combination of things. It's a little bit different for everyone, right? But we need to take that seriously. We have a responsibility to ourselves and to our God to try to be spiritually healthy whenever we can, in whatever ways we can, so we don't end up like this. Amen. 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 <laughs> Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. 
the whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. The word of God. Yes. I love having seminary students in worship because I just walk up and say, Hey, Evan, can you read this? Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> Greatly appreciate it. We bring everything that we have to worship. Our morning offering will be received, and may God bless all that we give in our time, our talents, and our treasures today. these offerings and the ways in which they are used to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be back. I'm over COVID. Speaking of praying, I put something in the newsletter, but I didn't give it to Ken in a good uh, order. So I wrote it out for you, 
and since we are, it's suggested to us that we pray, these are some suggestions from my friend, Sister Barbara Moore, where she's talking about what to do at the end of the eve, end of night, and just give you some ideas about how to pray in God's presence, how to be gratitude, have a review of the day, and have sorrow for the mistakes of the day, and then thank God for the the uh, a desire for the next day. So I'll put these in the back, and it just I tried to rem remember it on my own. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but I needed to write it out for me. So at the end of my when I go to sleep, before I go to sleep, I I use that little outline for prayers. Very simple, but uh, I thought you might like to use that. Luella is asking for prayer because her roommate is in the hospital and she needs a new roommate. So that I hope that you can find one, Luella. Laura Tubbs has COVID. Oh. Mine wasn't so bad. I didn't feel very sick, but I got it twice. I still was, was uh, even after the second time and the time of waiting, I still was, was checking my little tiny red thing at the bottom. And finally the nurse told me, if you're okay, with the symptoms, you can go on. She said the, the, it might go on on your test for 90 days. And so don't worry if it's just a little thing, but I'm glad to be back and I'm, I'm well rested, so. Let's turn to God in prayer. Holy eternal God, First, we are honored to be in conversation with you in the quiet of the morning. This is a reminder to us that we can always be in your presence at any time of the day, in any place. Thank you, Lord, for your very existence. We are so grateful, giving and loving God. We thank you for our families and friends who offer concern and love for us. We are so grateful for the sunshine after many cloudy and rainy days. The warmth and light cheers us in the middle of winter. We give thanks for this church, for its leaders, for all who seek and receive hope and care. We also have many sorrows today for those who have lost their lives to illness and aging, we mourn their loss. For many military and civilians around the world who are in the middle of warfare, protect them. For our own problems that make us feel unsafe and anxious, calm us, stay with us in hope. May we see the rainbow again. For the children, who are afraid and do not feel safe. May we put our arms around them and comfort them. We regret the mistakes we have made here and in the world. May we be more generous. May we be more peaceful. May we be more understanding. Forgive us when we slip on the path of life and lead us to a better way. Hear us, dear mother, father. As your children, we need your guidance and your love. Thank you. Thank you. We pray together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. third scripture lesson today is from 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 23. Hear the word of the Lord. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I must myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by my, all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share its blessings. May God give us understanding and wisdom from God's word. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. In your name we pray. So this week I got a text message from So In, and uh, So In, I'm going to use this as a bit of an illustration. Don't worry, it's good. The text message said, are you in the office? Yes. Well, how long are you going to be in the office for? Okay, till whenever. She said, can I meet you at 2 o'clock? I said, sure. So so Swin came into my office, but not before texting me one more time saying, it's urgent. (laughs) Now, when the moderator texts you, it's urgent. There's a moment of nervousness. So I was going through in my head all the things it could possibly be. I even took my keys out and got my church keys off and put them on the desk. Not even. <laughs> but so in came in with a smile on her face. And she had some roses. She gave one to me. And she offered me coffee. And then she said, I passed my thesis defense. And it just flowed out of her. The excitement, the enthusiasm, years of hard work, coursework, teaching, comprehensive examinations, writing, revising, defending, all of this just came flowing out of her. And it got me thinking, what are some of the things that have flowed out of you in terms of excitement in your life? Have you ever been so full of something that you just need to shout it from the rooftops? That it just needs to kind of come out? I thought about myself, and there have been a couple of instances where I've gotten home and I've said to Laura, guess what, guess what, guess what? And she goes, what? And it's, I I don't remember what it is, but it's just something that has to be said and come out. There are people in this congregation who have passions. Things that fill them up with so much great joy that they talk about them from time to time. I think of Trevor and flying and the airplanes, your models, and and it's something you can talk about with enthusiasm. Jane, it's gardening and please do something (laughs) with this. Please. With Kadin, it's your passion for Kachin State and all of the people that you remember there, and family, and friends. And for Tom, it's strategic planning. (laughs) To each his own. But many of us have things that we just need to talk about. We need to share. And today, the gospel, the message, or the reading that was shared, that Susan read, talks about one of those kinds of instances, that moment where something just needed to be said. It had filled so much up within Paul. He was so passionate about it. It drove him. And that topic was the gospel. The gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul was excited, even ecstatic, for the ministry that he'd been called to. And he felt compelled to go and to share that message with others, that mission that God had placed upon his heart. And throughout the early letters to believers, you can see that call, that sense of passion, that energy that he has, that he just has to get out and share it. Just let it flow from within him. In the passage today, he articulates a little bit more behind his motives. He describes and he defends his authority as an apostle to this church at Corinth. It's not just some sort of a casual hobby that he has, something that he does to get some sort of reward. Instead, he is compelled to share the good news. It's something he says he cannot resist. In fact, he says something will be missing if he doesn't do it. He'll be doomed if he lets this opportunity pass him by. That's his calling. And he wants to be clear to the people that he's not in it for money or for power or for any sort of gain, but rather for the sake of the calling itself. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those reality cooking shows on television. I've flipped past them from time to time. 
And what's interesting is they take all of these contestants and they're challenged to cook something. And sometimes they're giving these really strange ingredients. But they are told to present something that looks good and tastes good all within a certain time frame. And from time to time, the greatest criticism is that they go a little bit over the top. They're told by the judges that they should have pulled it back. They should have edited it back a little bit. That things would have been that much better if they didn't just go as far as they might have gone. And it got me thinking about Paul. In a, in a more biblical setting, of course, this isn't some sort of an apostle cooking show. He's not trying to be the best disciple, but yet he's still so full of energy and excitement. And sometimes I wonder if that in the past had gotten him into trouble a little bit. Because he was learning he didn't have to do everything all at once. Maybe, and this is some sort of a Pauline way of being told to pull it back a little bit. That sense that maybe he needed to take a step back and be a little less enthusiastic, a little less pushy, perhaps, with that message that he was sharing. So as he describes in this text, in his work as an apostle, he indicates that he's already put some limits on himself. In the verses leading up to this, he already directly, he refers to um, his refusal to take money for his work. So he doesn't want people to think that he's doing it only for the money. The financial pieces then don't encumber him and the communities that he serves. Instead, he wants to make himself and this message available for free. And going a little bit further back, back to chapter 8, we see how Paul discusses the importance of the Christian community limiting their eating of meat, sacrificed to pagan idols. Because he doesn't want that action to be some sort of a stumbling block for others in the community who might then fall down some sort of a slippery slope into the practices of those around them. In all of this discussion, what I'm getting at is that Paul has limited um, certain elements of what he is doing so it's for the good of the community, so that they might hear the message, they might receive the message, and know that it's coming from a good and a pure place. He gives those limits so that people know that he is a servant to the gospel, not his own power or his own desires. And he also embraces the limits of other perspectives. He embraces the limits that other groups uh, place to become a servant so that he might share the good news in a way that can be truly heard in a variety of contexts. That's where he says, I have become a servant too. I have become a servant too. He is saying that he is receiving the truth of those around him and, and becoming to the other people what they are so that they might not uh, be restricted in hearing that good news. Rather than just jamming the Bible down people's throats or screaming his message until his voice gets hoarse, he enters into their world so that he might experience it from their point of view. And from within those limits, those self-imposed limits, he keeps grounded in his compassion and his passion for Christ so that he might be able to proclaim the message in new and powerful ways. So that they might actually hear what he is saying within the limits of their own understanding. Notice Paul doesn't just come in and start screaming from the rooftops. This is the message. You must hear this message, receive it, and believe because he knows that doesn't work. He knows that that's the least effective way for people to receive this message based in love. He approaches them instead within a framework of love and a love for others. And it's from within that framework that he shares this good news. And he's not doing it for some manipulative way. He's not saying to himself, okay, how can I manipulate these people so that they might hear what I have to say? That's not how the gospel works. Instead, what he is doing is saying, I need to really bear my soul and allow you to bear your soul to me so that I can then hear what you have on your heart and that you might receive also what I have to say about what's on my heart. And it's from within that framework that he accomplishes incredible things. Paul was so full of enthusiasm for the gospel, just like you might be full of enthusiasm for something else. 
But Paul knows, just like us, he has to temper that excitement so that his words don't just kind of flow out and disappear, but will be heard. Many times we hear the phrase, know your limits. And we see that as something that's discouraging or difficult, perhaps something that's negative, implying that we're unable to do something. But I want to suggest that this text says the opposite, that Paul's approach to evangelism turns that idea on its head. Knowing our limits, knowing the limits of one's community and context are what allowed Paul to excel, to be so successful, to expand and grow the kingdom of God for the sake of the gospel. And these limitations open the door for creativity because he knew he had to do things in different ways so that he might not be able to just go to uh, his standard way of going about things, but rather to be sensitive and in doing so to be perhaps a little more creative in how he shared the good news. Paul's embracing different perspectives and different worldviews allowed him to fully proclaim the message that he couldn't help but share. And notice that no matter what the limitations might be, either by others or self-imposed, God found a way to get that message across. So as disciples today, as people who are learning together what it means to follow God and to share that good news, I want to encourage us. Encourage us to think about the frameworks or the limitations that we might have, and then to consider how God and the Holy Spirit might breathe new and creative life into the retelling of God's own story, the good news, the gospel. And I believe that when we look at our own limitations, when we look at the ways in which we share the gospel by word, by deed, by, by those moments of, of creativity, those moments of opportunity, we might recognize that it's not about us. It's not about a pat on our own back. It's not about putting a check mark next to those people that we have shared the good news with. It's for the sake of the gospel. Paul modeled that for us, and may we follow in Paul's footsteps, and may we share that good news with a heart full of love. Amen. 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 Speaking of a heart full of love, we have a table before us. This, this table represents for us the epitome of God's love for us. It's a reminder of Christ's sacrifice for each of us and our desire to be reminded of that experience of Christ upon the cross and also the love that poured out for the forgiveness of sins. This is not our table. It's not the table of Lake Avenue Baptist Church, but it's God's table, and we are all welcome. Let us sing together. Where across the crowded ways of life, we'll sing together the hymn that's printed in your order of service. <laughs>
on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord took a loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us give thanks for the bread. Loving God, we thank you for the bread that symbolizes your body broken for us. And may we receive it in the ways in which you gave it, in love. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. of this bread in remembrance of Christ's body broken for us. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us give thanks for the cup. Loving God, let us receive this cup in the way in which you gave it in love. In your name we pray. Amen.
Let us drink of this cup in remembrance of Christ's blood shed for us. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's sing together the first verse of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. and blessing is printed in your order of service. Though our lives often seem overwhelming, in God we shall mount up with wings like eagles. Though our responsibilities weigh us down, in Christ we shall run and not be weary. Though injustice and discord tap our strength, in the spirit we shall walk and not faint. Go with the power of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank mm-hmm. you.